Well, welcome to another Dose of Science. And boy, do we have a good dose for you today. Very special guest, Dr. Paul Offit. Uh, you've seen him here, but more importantly than that, no, maybe not more importantly, he's been on CNN numerous times uh, during the whole COVID uh, issue. He's a professor of vaccinology, University of Pennsylvania, uh, where he um, uh, uh, also runs the uh, Vaccine Information uh, Center at the, the uh, Children's Hospital. And uh, he's written a number of books. He's an advisor to CDC. And his newest book, which we will talk about in a few minutes, is, is just out. It's called You Bet for Your Life. Also joining us today is our regular uh, Jonathan Jerry. <clears throat> so, Paul, welcome. Thank you. And uh, I, you probably, of course, like, like uh, most of us, are getting a bit sick and tired about COVID. But unfortunately, this virus isn't going to go away. It's not leaving us uh, alone. And there always is something to, uh, to talk about. And uh, over the last few weeks, we've, we've um, uh, certainly had uh, a, a lot of discussion with, uh, about the anti-vaxxer problem, uh, et, et cetera. And uh, it is a problem in Canada, but it's, it's a bigger problem in, in your country. Uh, so, um, what about people like Simon Gold, this uh, you know who is uh, part of the uh, uh, America's Frontline Doctors? Uh, they made a splash in, in the summer when they held this meeting in front of the Supreme Court. At that time, they were promoting hydroxychloroquine. Now they're into ivermectin, and uh, uh, of course, uh, they question vaccine. Uh, what what? Uh, what do you think the scientific and medical community uh, can do to, to lessen the impact of, of these people? Because they do have an impact. I mean, they're very good at what they do, right? They get their message out there. They, they get in front of the cameras. Yeah, and this is not new. I, you, you have, I mean, Andrew Wakefield was actually a well-respected researcher, um, you know, in, in, from London. Um, and and who did good work actually on on uh, sort of the uh, looking at Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, trying to figure out the vasculitis that was associated with that. Uh, he was at a well at a renowned hospital, and then I don't know what happened. He published a paper that wasn't a paper at all. I, it was it wasn't it certainly wasn't a study. It was just eight children who developed autism within a month of receiving the vaccine. It's amazing it was ever it was ever published, but he sort of fell off a cliff, and it's not novel, right? You have somebody like Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes, who became convinced that vitamin C was a treatment for everything, including cancer. Peter Duisberg, who was a well-respected retrovirologist, who became an AIDS denialist. Um, the, the um, you know, so, so this is not a new phenomenon. What do you do about it? I, 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 I mean, in a better world, um, professional or ethical societies that are associated with, with granting licenses would, would crack down on something like that because he's doing harm. I mean, he puts people in harm's way. Uh, you know, ivermectin doesn't work. Hydroxychloroquine didn't work. Hydroxychloroquine had significant side effects, cardiac side effects. Ivermectin has GI side effects, although there was this little... And it's used ivermectin for who people don't know is a um, is used sort of like as a horse the warmer at least in part. So there was a great YouTube video. I don't know if you saw this, but ask your large animal veterinarian whether ivermectin is right for you. Yeah. It up. I saw a new study though that just came out I think two or three days ago, where they used uh, ivermectin in um, patients uh, not hospitalized who had had a positive uh, uh, COVID test and who were symptomatic, but had various comorbidities, uh, diabetes, obesity, et cetera. And they were put on uh, uh, three days of IV ivermectin. And they, they actually had a significant control group. Uh, I think it, the whole population was over 500 and they had significantly fewer who ended up in the hospital. So I mean, there, there are some of these, you know, there might be something to it under some condition in, 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 in some people. But then they extrapolate it, you know, to, to, to absurdity. You know, you'd like it to be um, confirmed by other groups using other populations. I mean, then truths emerge. So I'm not yeah, sure it's yeah, I mean, yet, that, That's why, you know, we always say you never set store by one one study. But, you know, sometimes there are little victories like we had one uh, just today here in Canada. There's this guy who's a small town physician in, in Ontario. He's sort of a mental pipsqueak. 
uh, but uh, you know he he makes a lot of noise and he's got a fo- lot of followers on on the uh, on social media. He's an anti-vaxer and he's made the reason that I really have have uh, launched into him is because he makes these these nefarious comparisons to Germany uh, that uh, you know the way that the Nazis uh, try to to um, you know suppress some thought and force theirs is, is what's happening now. So anyway, the uh, uh, Ontario Medical Association now has come out with this and, and they have barred him from signing these certificates, you know, accusing people from vaccines or, or mass. So sometimes you get these uh, little victories, but they're not, not out there too often. But anyway, one, one question that comes up repeatedly now is about the third dose, the booster, the Pfizer booster. What's the latest on that? <clears throat> So, well, the question is, what's the problem? I mean, if, if the goal of the vaccine is to prevent serious illness, which Dr. Walensky, who's the head of the CDC, has consistently said, and Dr. Fauci has consistently said, then the, the mRNA vaccines have done that. I mean, if you look at the most recent data that's been presented by the CDC or published by the CDC, what they have consistently found is that the protection against serious illness is in the 80 to 90 percent range, including Delta, including all age groups. So if, if, if the goal of the vaccine is being met, then it's not clear why a third dose is needed. What's happened is a couple of things. One is that, that there was a study in Israel that showed that at least for those over 60, although a closer look at the study, I think more accurately those over 70, um, there was some fading of immunity against severe illness and that with a booster dose that lessened. Um, it was something like uh, 18% uh, in the non-booster group to like 4% in the booster group. So, so you could argue that, the, the, that at least those data support the use possibly of a third dose in people who are over 70. Um, and, and which is sort of falls under the rubric, frankly, of the immune compromised host. I mean, as you get older, your immune system is less vigorous, more senescent. So that, that's we already have a, a third dose recommendation for people who are immune compromised. To me, that falls under that group. The, the, and, and, and it's consistent with what you would expect biologically. I mean, when you're given a vaccine, you develop neutralizing antibodies in your bloodstream. You also develop memory B cells. The difference is memory B cells don't make antibodies. They just kind of hang out in your bone marrow and your lymph nodes. And then when confronted with the virus, they will become activated and differentiate and become antibody secreting cells. Those are usually long lived, years, if not decades. And there's plenty of time to from the time when you're first exposed to a virus to the time that you're seriously ill you know with lung disease in the the icu to for those cells to become activated and differentiated it's it's much easier to prevent serious disease than it is asymptomatic or mild disease I get the analogy I use is the fire extinguisher in the, in the kitchen, right? You, the fire extinguisher represents memory B cells. So the, the fire starts in, in the kitchen. Um, and then, you know, the, you, you don't, you can't stop the fire from starting. That's sort of the asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection. But the, the fire extinguisher keeps the house from burning down, which is the serious disease. The, to prevent mild or asymptomatic infection, you need high levels of neutralizing antibodies in your bloodstream. That fades over time. That's true for every vaccine. Take your pick, rotavirus, pertussis, whooping cough, influenza. Antibodies will always fade over time. But generally, who cares? You know, we, we, I mean, the vaccine I was fortunate enough to be part of at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia prevented moderate to severe disease, but it didn't prevent asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection. It kept children out of the hospital, basically. Um, and the good news is we didn't call asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection breakthrough illness, which is one of the many communication errors in this. I mean, we hold this vaccine, to a, we hold no other vaccine. Um, breakthrough implies failure, and that's not a failure. The goal is to keep you out of the hospital, which this vaccine does. So, so now you're at sort of a different reasoning. Now the reasoning is, okay, but if I, if, if antibodies do fade in the bloodstream, which they do, and I give a, bo- a booster dose, this truly is a booster dose. I mean, because you're, you're now boosting the, the immune system um, to, to make more antibodies. Um, then you can prevent, do a, a better job of preventing mild or asymptomatic infection, during which time you shed virus, during which time you can be contagious. And so in theory, that may have some impact on the pandemic, but probably not a lot. I mean, if you want to have a big impact on the pandemic, vaccinate people who are unvaccinated. I mean, when we see people at our hospital or the adult hospital next door that are in the ICU, it's not because they didn't get a third dose, it's because they didn't get any doses. And so that really has to be the focus, I think. But so this has become very muddled. You know, I think when President Biden stood up at the podium and said, on September 20th, we're going to have a third dose for everybody over 16 years of age. You get it eight months after your second dose, or then he modified it to six months after your second dose. He sent out 
got the message that you weren't protected with two doses. And that's not true. You are protected against severe disease with two doses, which the CDC tried to clarify later. But I think it's been really muddled. I think it's fair to say if you're over 65 or 70 years old, it's reasonable to get a third dose. If you're if you're over 50 and have um, a high risk medical condition or a medical condition that puts you at risk of more severe disease, you could reasonably get a third dose. Although, you know, I don't really see the data there that proves that yet. And then for those less than than uh, the, the 18 to uh, to sort of 49. Um, you know, the, the, it's, the, the, it's more of a should be considered for you. So if you have a high risk medical condition or if you work in a place that has um, high transmission, either because of the occupation or institution, um, but that's softer. That was you, you would fall into that category because you work in a hospital. Hey, I fall into the over 65 category, man. But thank you, Frank, you for not realizing that's where I fell. <laughs> so are you eligible to get the third dose? I, I am. It's not hard to get a third dose here. I mean, it's not like pharmacists are asking you where you where you work. I see. I see. You know, the Israeli situation is a real conundrum, and I get regular updates on this because my son-in-law is pretty high up in the Israeli medical community, and they're very concerned uh, because the infection rate is is high. I mean, the uh, the Israeli population is about the same as ours here in Quebec, and their daily infection rate now is about ten times what we are seeing here in Quebec. And they had, in the beginning, one of the best results. So it's hard to know what's going on there. What, what do you think? Too, too, too early relaxation? Well, that certainly happened, right? I mean, they sort of let loose and then they sort of pulled back a little bit. So that may have been part of it. And, and again, it, the goal... In a better world, um, well, see, the difference is if you, if you get an influenza vaccine and then have mild or asymptomatic disease um, or pertussis vaccine, whooping cough vaccine, and then have mild or asymptomatic disease, you're not getting PCR tested to see that you're still shedding virus and getting quarantined. So here it becomes more important to try and prevent that. And so we hold this to a very high standard. The term infection implies asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection. I mean, that's that's going to happen. So, I mean, that's just the nature of all this. And, and even though who are vaccinated are at risk for that. If we're trying to prevent that, then really we're getting, we're talking probably about yearly or, or every two year dosing. That's what, that's what we're talking about. So that's why the phrasing is important. Uh, if you're calling this a three dose vaccine, that means that you're good after three doses, like the hepatitis B vaccine or inactivated polio vaccine. Um, and, and so then you, you're arguing that three doses is enough to protect you then for years to come. This is it. You're done. But if you're trying to prevent mild or asymptomatic infection, that's not going to be enough. And in which case, now the phrasing isn't three dose series, it's booster dosing, which is not going to be just a one time thing. Right. Jonathan, you've been looking into this since since the beginning. Here's your chance to get to Paul. Well, well, I, I had a I had a medical ethics question for Paul. Actually, uh, I was wondering about your thoughts on this. So, so medicine, as I, I'm not a medical doctor, obviously. So, as I understand it, medicine has as one of its guiding principles the idea of triage, right, of helping people who are worse off first with no judgments towards how they came to require medical care. And I'm seeing a lot now on uh, well, many people on the internet that are you know people who are not vaccinated require for COVID should I either not be treated or they should not be prioritized because, of course, their decision has had consequences on people who are requiring surgeries or medical care in general. What do you make of this argument as a, as a physician? It's hard. I mean, it's hard to sort out. You broke up a little bit during your, your question, but, oh, but sorry. that's all right. It, it's hard to sort out. Um, you're right. I mean, you could argue that then if you're going to extend that, that you shouldn't take care of someone who is obese and has heart disease because they overeat or, or someone who smokes and has you know, lung cancer. Um, I, I think that, that um, you know, it's it's awful when people make a decision not to, that an adult makes a decision not to get a vaccine. I mean, you certainly have enough information at this point that the vaccine is safe and effective and keeps you out of the hospital and keeps you out of the morgue. So it's a sort of a willfully ignorant or incredibly selfish thing to do. Um, nonetheless, I mean, there are people who, despite being vaccinated, still don't make a very good immune response also. But, you, you know, you, I think that it's just hard to separate that out. What worries me in this is that we're about to give a third dose in this country now to a lot of people who probably aren't going to benefit from it. Not much, certainly not nearly as much as people in the 195 countries out there, many of which haven't given a single dose of vaccine. I mean, you could argue we would do far more good for, for all of us, including our country, if we just sent those vaccines overseas and let people 
get their first two doses. In terms of this vaccine equity, like what are your thoughts on what went wrong there? The usual stuff, I'm guessing. Well, I mean, the, the, um, the Biden administration wanted this to happen. They wanted a third dose. They drew a line. They said September 20th, which is um, what we didn't like about the last administration, where they would simply declare something, like declare hydroxychloroquine or convalescent plasma or Clorox chewables or whatever they were declaring. <laughs> You know, now we have sort of this 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 administration also sort of declared that without without really going through the process, which is, you know, what's the problem? Uh, what's your solution to the problem? So let's say it's it's that there's fading immunity against severe disease. Here's your solution. You've done a study showing that a third dose prevents that largely. Then you go to the FDA to allow the company, which is a regulatory agency, to allow the company to distribute then the vaccine under that auspices. And then it goes to the CDC to say, okay, here's the groups for whom we recommend it. Uh, but it didn't happen that way. It sort of happened backwards. And it was rushed, too. I mean, I'm on the FDA's vaccine advisory committee. And, you know, the, the Israeli paper on which we were basing much of our decisions sort of came out the day before. I don't understand what the rush was in all this. You know, getting back to the, the ethics, uh, because there's so much talk now that, you know, priority should be given to people who who were vaccinated. You know, if someone comes into the hospital and they're not vaccinated. But uh, isn't part of medical ethics, I mean, if you have a terrorist act and a terrorist is injured and an innocent bystander is injured, you treat whoever needs the treatment first, irrespective of who they are? Right. That's right. Yeah. So, the, so the, it's really a non-argument, you know, that these people use that that doctors uh, are, are going to lean towards treating those who are vaccinated first. I mean, I don't think that that's going to happen. It's not allowed by, uh, by the, uh, basically by ethics. Um, <clears throat> Uh, certainly, uh, the uh, influence of uh, celebrities is immense. And, you know, I mean, we talked about uh, sometimes scientists and doctors spreading false information. But when uh, they uh, spread it, it doesn't have nearly the weight as when a celebrity like, like, like Madonna or, or Woody Harrelson or just last week, Nicki Minaj, right? Uh, I mean, they have a huge, huge uh, impact. I mean, this was... Uh, event last week, I mean, this was almost comical, uh, you know, when, when she claims that a, a friend of her cousin, you know, so it's not even firsthand information, a friend of her cousin had his testicles swollen because they might have had a vaccine. But Paul, this, Paul what is your medical opinion on swollen <laughs> testicles? We need to know. <laughs> you know, I yield to Nicki Minaj on that. And this is very frustrating because these people, you, I mean, you, you know, we're too small potatoes to even get into any battle with, uh, with these people. Uh, it, it's really a, a very, a very frustrating thing. No, oh, it is. And I, you know, you're given a platform. Your celebrity gives you a platform, and a lot of people use that platform for the public good, right? Jerry Lewis to sort of, you know, his his. Uh, his his advocacy for children and, and, and chronic diseases in childhood. I mean, that was that was great. And, and a lot of I mean, you know, Charles Barkley is an NBA star who who's, you know says get vaccinated. What are you thinking about? You know, so and then others don't. You know, they they don't. So it's it's but, you know, interestingly, we see this from scientists who get the pedestal too, like you know the Nobel disease, right? The Nobel Prize winners all of a sudden become celebrities, and people think that they're experts on everything. And then they start to think themselves that they are experts on, on everything. And, you know, I mean, we, we have strange things like Carrie Mullis thinking that he met a, 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 a talking green raccoon. Fluorescent. Uh, fluorescent. <laughs> well, what? There was a fluorescent raccoon. Fluorescent raccoon. Okay. That's different. That's a whole different story. <laughs> and Luc Montagnier, who, who now thinks that there's something to homeopathy. Uh, so it's not only these uh, uneducated celebrities who, who can spread uh, scientific uh, nonsense. No, you're right. We've had it before, sort of, you know, uh, Luke Bonnier also believed that antibiotics could treat autism. And then we, we, you know, talked about others who did this as Linus Pauling, you know, the yeah. 
the Peter Duisberg. There's people, smart people who some, I don't know what happens. And I think you, you nailed it. I think once you're like brilliant and incredibly right, you know, like Kerry Mollis developing PCR, I think you just think you, you're never wrong. Yeah. Well, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, because uh, you wrote a whole book about this, about religious exemptions uh, from, from vaccines. And I, I am hearing from some people, you know, this idea of religious exemptions from the COVID vaccine. And I was wondering, what are they based on? Is it simply the idea that cells from an aborted fetus might at some point have played a role in the research? No, I think when no. people claim a religious exemption, um, it's because they know they can. Because in, at least in, in our country, the minute you say this is an expression of your faith, Everybody stands back. Nobody likes to tell people how to express their faith. I would argue that there is no religion uh, that really condones the kind of selfish act that is associated with not vaccinating yourself or your children. I mean, religions teach you to care about your children, care about your family, care about your society. Putting them in harm's way unnecessarily is a profoundly unreligious thing to do. Although there, there is, so I did write a book called Bad Faith, When Religious Belief Undermines Modern Medicine. But there's a story that relates to vaccines here I think you'll find interesting, especially regarding mandating vaccines. The, one of the, 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 the woman who sort of I really in many ways uh, devoted the book to, because I was really so impressed by her, was a Christian scientist, raised in Christian science. She was brilliant, actually. I mean, she uh, graduated from Vanderbilt with a PhD in um, British Romantic Poetry. Um, and then she, um, with her two children, she didn't vaccinate either of her two children. Her youngest, uh, Matthew, when he was 15 months old, developed bacterial meningitis. She chooses prayer instead of antibiotics and over a 10 day period watches him die. Then she sort of has an epiphany. She walks into a medical school library, reads everything she can about bacterial meningitis and, and realizes she, in her words that she'd been duped by her church. And so she be, has been a thorn in the side of the Christian science church ever since. <laughs> what amazed me in her telling her story was she vaccinated her dog. And when I asked her why, she said, because it was the law. Wow. Was the law. The, 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 I mean, the brain as a belief engine never ceases to amaze me. The kind of the contortions, the pretzel logic, the, the buffet of like, I pick this, but not that. And it's incredible what we're capable of. Um, you know, we, we, we have RNA vaccines now and they've, they've proven that they work. And I'm curious to know what other uses of this RNA technology that you are excited about in the realms of, of vaccines. Right. So this is at least in part the work of Drew Weissman, Weissman and Caitlin Carrico. Weissman is at Penn where I work. And, and so this technology is more than 15 years old. It's not a novel technology. And so it, there are a number of people who work using t t this technology to see whether you can do for make vaccines, a universal flu vaccine, an HIV vaccine, um, a better tuberculosis vaccine, a malaria vaccine. So all that work is ongoing. Uh, we'll see. It certainly is was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. When we were uh, being brought together to make decisions about what vaccines we were going to approve through emergency use authorization, we were basically told if it's 50 percent effective with a lower confidence interval of 30 percent, license it or at least approve it through EUA. And then that if it was 70 percent effective, which as Tony Fauci had said, that would be amazing. You know, it was 95 percent effective. Now, that was just over a three month period. So 95 percent effective over three months, which gives vaccines, you know, the best chance they can to look good because you're just looking at a very short period of time. Um, but still, that's amazing. Did you know Kathleen Carrico when she was doing the, the work? I didn't know. I've talked to her since, but I, I didn't know her before that. Yeah. Oh, something else that comes up quite often now is the difference between um, immunity gains from vaccines versus natural immunity. And uh, there was uh, an incident uh, just last week in Edmonton where someone was holding uh, a COVID party to, to try to get everyone infected, claiming that, uh, you know, natural infection is the way to go. Never a good idea. That's the general rule. I mean, um, you know, the goal of vaccines is to induce the immunity of, that's, that's, uh, that occurs following natural infection without asking people to pay the price of natural infection. Um, and, and, you know, because you know uh, SARS-CoV-2 can cause disease which can be fatal, you, why would you ever take that chance? And, that, and that's everybody. I mean, obviously, you're at greater risk if you're over 80 than if you're five. But the fact of the matter is everybody is at risk of, of dying from this virus. I mean, I work at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, you know, in concert with the national average. I was on service last week, and we were seeing a lot of children with who were sick with this virus, including a handful in the intensive care unit. 
Um, just go around in the hospital and you'll be convinced to, to get this vaccine. Um, but to, to put children at harm's way, I can tell you when we, we first started making videos at the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, um, we made one just talking about that, about sort of relative risks. And well, the person who was the cameraman, um, his sister had actually taken their child to a chickenpox party where the child proceeded to get so-called hemorrhagic chickenpox, severe chickenpox, which affected the lung and died. The child died after a chickenpox party. We wanted actually to interview her for the for our uh, little movie, but she refused and understandably refused. I mean, she just couldn't go through that story again. But imagine that. Can you use monoclonal antibodies on children? Yes. Uh -huh. and over, it's over 12, yeah. So, I mean, I think it is a uh, license for over 12. But yeah, no, but not as inpatients. As outpatients, so so mild disease, mildly symptomatic, mildly symptomatic. Once you're in the hospital, you know it, it's you know the the virus attaches, enters, reproduces itself, and so replication increases, and then you start to make an immune response. As your immune response increases, that's when you get more symptomatic. And so by the time the kids are in the hospital, viral replication is really not as critical a part of the disease process. So it doesn't work as well. Same thing with remdesivir or antivirals. So what what's the what's now the general protocol for children in the ICU? Right. So if they have oxygen requirement, dexamethasone. Um, if they're severely ill, this um, uh, um, it's called uh, uh, it is baricitinib. Baricitinib. Right. Yeah. They make it so that you cannot pronounce it. Baricitinib. It's called, and so it's a Jack two inhibitor. So it, it um, has normally, for example, if uh, the because it's the immune response that's causing disease. So, for example, if you're making high titers of interleukin-6, which is associated with like CAR-T therapy and, and other problems, um, you can give tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6. The JAK-2 sort of works that way, except it decreases synthesis of those cytokines. So it actually is even more powerful in that way. And, and there are data recently published in the Journal of Medicine that it does decrease mortality. So, ba so baricitinib has now become more. What, what is the uh, general outcome for children in the ICU versus adults in the ICU? Right. So I don't work in the adult hospital, but I can tell you just from statistically, children generally do well. They do. I mean, they're younger, healthier. They generally do well. Although when we see children, usually it's because they have a risk factor. Chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, obesity is probably the most common risk factor. So, for example, now in your hospital, how many children would there be in ICU? Um, when I was on service a week ago, and I'll be on service again next week, um, I think there were three or four in the ICU. Okay. I say Ada has joined us. Uh, yes, hello. Hi. Sorry about that. Any questions? Well, I'm worried now that I'm going to end up re-asking a question, but do you have any um, insight into the potential applications of mRNA vaccines for cancers? No, it's a great question. I mean, in theory, what could what could happen is, you, you know, cancer cells tend to evade the immune system as you could find a way to target, you know, using maybe the lipid nanoparticle, but target that mRNA to uh, cancer cells, have them express a protein that's easily recognized by the immune system so that cancer can be eliminated. Sure. And gene therapy in general. Uh, breath tests. A lot of, lot of uh, literature coming out about, uh, about this now. Uh, because, uh, I mean, certainly, you know, there's validity. I mean, we, we know that some diseases have certain smells. We know that dogs can detect certain uh, smells. So it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility that, that uh, some of the compounds produced during COVID metabolism have certain uh, smell. And I know in Singapore, they already are, are using this. If, if you have to travel to Singapore, you have, this is what they do. They, you have to breathe into this tube and, and they rely on this. So the question is, how reliable is this? Right, so it's, it's testable. I, we can find out how reliable it is. Um, the, Audrey John, in our, who's our division chief at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in infectious diseases, has worked on that for malaria. You know, they, that you know, dogs can smell who's yeah. infected with malaria. It's interesting. I know in, in Finland, in, in the airport, they have dogs to sniff out COVID. I mean, of course, we've long had dogs to sniff out explosives. But now there's sniffing out uh, COVID. I mean, it, yes, it's, yeah. What's, it's, what's especially weird to me, though, is that the breakdown products of the metabolism with COVID is specific enough to detect COVID as opposed to other viral infections. Because I would expect most, you know, metabolism with a viral infection to be fairly similar. 
this is a weird virus. Uh, this is an un, this is a respiratory virus unlike one I've ever seen. I mean, it, it causes. I mean, what respiratory virus causes this degree of vasculitis that it affects not only the lungs but also you know heart, liver, kidney. Um, you know, is associated with strokes and heart attacks. This is a really unusual virus. I'm looking forward to defining what are those immunological factors that's associated with, with affecting endothelial cells that cause this degree of vascular damage. And this so-called multi-system inflammatory disease of children, which we see a lot in our hospital, um, is, is nothing like anything I've ever seen associated with the virus before. It's so, so it is a weird virus, and maybe that allows one to figure it out or detect it better. I'm, I'm sure that our, our viewers will want to hear your thoughts on this. So what are your thoughts on the lab leak hypothesis? I think the chances of that happening are about zero. There was a, recently a paper by Susan Weiss and co-workers at a pen um, in, it was, I think it was in Cell, called The Origins of SARS-CoV-2. And then also there's a podcast um, called This Week in Virology, where Vince Racaniello, you probably listened to that, as a um, epidemiologist or a, a virologist out of Columbia, but he's had a series of people, virologists on the show. But I think the general consensus is that this is a product of nature. Um, we'll, and we'll eventually figure it out. We'll figure out how this was a product of nature as soon as China gives us more access. But, but I, I don't think that it's created. I mean, the, the, at least looking at the prototypic virus that, that was being worked on in that Wuhan lab, it, would, it, it just doesn't make sense that this would have come from there. But is it possible that they would have been working on some natural virus that, that leaked out? I guess it's possible. I mean, you know, there was that in Birmingham, England, there was a smallpox virus leak. I don't know if you remember that. So um, it's, it's possible. I don't think they created it. I mean, were they right. working on yeah. it and then yeah. it leaked out? I guess that's possible. But I think the more likely bet it just spread from those, those uh, you know, wet markets where they had all these different m mammals all together in unsanitary, many of which were not legally sold, these mammals. One of the really constantly recurring themes of the anti-vax people is that this vaccine was brought out too quickly and that there were shortcuts taken and that there were no animal experiments. And, you know, so often we see this, this argument that, that never before has there been a vaccine introduced without first animal trials. Right. Well, that's not true, first of all. I mean, there, there were preclinical studies in, non -human, in mice and non-human primates before this vaccine rolled out. I mean, it was truly the fastest vaccine ever made. That's true. I mean, we isolated and sequenced the virus in January of 2020. There were two clinical trials that were essentially completed by November, you know, 30,000, 44,000. That's amazing. But the reason that happened was, at least for the, on the Moderna side, you had... Um, you had basically the government taking the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. So they did phase one dose ranging trials and then moved pretty quickly to phase three trials, you know, large prospective placebo control trials. At the same time they were doing that, they were mass producing the vaccine, um, understanding that if the vaccine didn't work or wasn't safe, they were going to be throwing out millions and millions of doses. So it, it was the unfortunately innate Operation Warp Speed, which I think didn't calm people down about how quickly this was being made. But certainly safety guidelines were not uh, truncated. I mean, as for, 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 first of all, the size of the trials was the size of any any adult or pediatric vaccine trial. The safety follow up was the same safety follow up for any pediatric or adult vaccine trial, which basically two months after dose two, because any serious side effect that's occurred with vaccines for the last two hundred years has occurred generally within two months after dose two, and or two within two months of dose two. And then um, and the, really where it was truncated in terms of the trials was was efficacy follow up, which was only for th three months or so. But then in, in the midst of a pandemic. You're not going to do a two-year trial or three-year trial. You're going to put it out there and assuming if it's this effective over three months, it's going to continue to be pretty effective for a while. Isn't it true that historically with vaccines, if there's any kind of serious side effect noted, it is soon after the vaccine. It doesn't happen two, three years down the road. Exactly, and which has been true, by the way, with the serious side effects of these vaccines. I mean, if you look, for example, at myocarditis, you know, which is a rare consequence of the mRNA vaccines, it's usually within about four days of getting the second dose. Uh, same thing with the, the clotting, which is usually seen within a week of getting that um, vaccine, the severe clotting that, yeah. that occurs with J&J &J and AstraZeneca's vaccine. So let me just ask you this, because here's some info that I was just sent today uh, from um, last week's VAERS uh, statistics. It says, in total, 726,963 adverse reactions, including 15,000 deaths, 
20,000 permanent disabilities, 8,000 Bell's palsy, 2,000 miscarriages, 7,000 heart attacks, 149,000 ER hospitalizations. Now, this, this they claim comes from the, the vaccine adverse event reporting system. Right, which at its best is a hypothesis generating mechanism, um, at, but it's certainly not a hypothesis testing mechanism because there's no control group. So if you've gotten Bell's palsy, for example, after this vaccine, then the question becomes, are you more likely to get it than the, the general population? And, 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 and the answer is no. The deaths, obviously, Tucker Carlson's made a big deal of the deaths. He said that a few times. I, I think back in May is when he first said there's been 3,300 deaths associated with getting this various vaccine, getting this, uh, this COVID-19 vaccines more than all other vaccines combined. So, so just analyzing that for a moment, at that point, there were 100 million uh, people who'd been vaccinated roughly. So he, he, if, you, if you look at, at the death statistics in the United States, about 750 people die per 100,000 people, um, which is about per year. So that's about two, pe two people die per 100,000 per day. So if you've, if you've vaccinated 100 million people, that means 2,000 people will have died within 24 hours. You know, four, about 4,000 would have died within 48 hours unless the vaccine confers immortality, which it doesn't. It only prevents SARS-CoV-2 infections. So it's, it's, you know, it's just terrible. The system, you could argue that Varus has done more harm than good because it just scares people. You know, they assume that if it's reported to this sort of this uh, official sounding name, that it must be real and and. And it's not, uh, for the most part, it's not. Although Varus did pick up myocarditis. I mean, there was there was, a, there was an abnormal number of cases of myocarditis that were reported primarily in young boys or men, uh, primarily after dose two. And that really was the trigger for looking at that more closely. So that's when Varus works well. But all the list of things that you just read are when Varus doesn't work well and scares people. But isn't there it also true that if, uh, if you do contract COVID, you also increase your uh, your risk of myocarditis more than with the vaccine. Much greater. There was a JAMA cardiology paper that looked at athletes in the Big Ten conference who had COVID-19, all of them. They did catalinium-enhanced MR magnetic resonance imaging on their heart of all of them to find that the incidence of, um, of myocarditis was like 2.5%, which is like roughly one in 45 people um, got myocarditis associated with getting SARS-CoV-2 infection, which is a lot greater than the roughly one in 20,000 who get it from the vaccine. That's true of virtually all side effects. Most side effects are seen, if they're seen here, they're usually seen off there. It's the same thing with clotting. The clotting um, was, is much more common, about fivefold more common, even severe clotting in, uh, in people who get SARS-CoV-2 than in, in people who are vaccinated. But you know, people have a, we're not very good at assigning risk. We assume that doing nothing is a risk-free choice when it's really just right. a choice to take a different risk. Well, we're getting to the end Thinking of, of here. Uh, I just want to ask you a couple more questions. I, I saw in your bio somewhere that your your dad was a shirt maker, and and that that uh, uh, you got into into science because you didn't like the the uh, the way that uh, some of the salespeople were exaggerating uh, their products. No, no. What, what I think more accurately. So my father was the head of a sales force for men's shirts. And so every six months, he would bring them all in from all over the country and they would have these sales meetings, which I would go to for the food primarily. But, you know, it just, I just I, I love these guys. I mean, they just they were they were so affable and fun. You like to be around them because, as as was said in someone, one of the uh, Barry Levinson's movies, you know, you don't sell the product, you sell yourself. And, and, and I think what drove me to science was I thought I have no chance of selling myself. So let's I just want to do the data part you know let the data sell itself okay very good and finally the most important question how are your eagles doing oh my god did you see last night's game it's like <laughs> it, they should have caught like when, when my children used to play you know, my, my son used to play football you know they would have like the 30 to nothing rule where they would just that's where i felt that game should have just been called we were completely outplayed it was painful Okay, Paul. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for joining us. It's it's uh, not only always tremendously informative, but always fun to to uh, speak with you. But hold on, Joe. I mean, uh, Paul was just talking about risk. If only there was a book that was coming out about risk. If only. If only. If only. All right. A book. There is one. <laughs> it is. It is called "You Bet Your Life." Do you have do you have it on hand, Paul? You know, you it, the as cover. it turns out, I actually have it here. Then here it's I'm. Strange coincidence. We hold it up. So. 
There beautiful it is. Cover. And undoubtedly uh -huh. beautiful, beautiful. on this Amazon. Is, the subtitle is From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccination, The Long and Risky History of Medical Innovation. But, but basically it's about um, when do you know enough? You know, so I go through all these nine major medical advances and sort of stop at various intervals. Say, okay, would you get it now? Would you get it now? Now you learn about this. Would you get it now? Would you get it now? And we're always there. We're there here with the, these vaccines. I mean, when do you when do you think you know enough? Because you never know everything. That's that's the sad truth. And, and one thing, just as I can, just one story, because it, it's sort of the emotional part of this book for me was I think what is never appreciated is the price paid for knowledge. So, for example, when we did the 12 to 15 year old trial, when Pfizer did the 12 to 15 year old trial, there was a 2300 child trial. Um, half got vaccine, half got placebo. There were 18 cases of COVID in that trial, all in the placebo group, all. So I got a lot of when that vaccine was then approved for use in children or through EUA, I got a lot of hate mail for that saying 2300 children. Really? Sit. You're not going to do the you, for, for adults. You did 30,000, 40,000. Now you're doing 2300 and you're going to give it to millions of children. To which my response is, we could do 23,000 children. We could do a 23,000 ch child trial, in which case there wouldn't be 18 cases of COVID. There would be 180, presumably most, if not all, in the placebo group. When do you know enough? And and what, why that's emotional for me is is because I think these children never got the due that they were owed. When Jonas Salk made his polio vaccine, he made it by growing polio up in the in the, in the uh, cells, purified the virus, uh, killed it with formaldehyde. Um, he tested it in 700 children in the Pittsburgh area, found that it was highly immunogenic, that it was safe, and he said, I got it. Let's give this, let's give children the polio vaccine. But the, the March of Dimes said, got to do a trial first. And that broke his heart. He didn't want to do a trial. He didn't want to give children placebo, you know, during when knowing that we were heading the summer and that they could be at risk. So 420,000 children were given the vaccine, 200,000 were given placebo. And the trial was done. And, and when it was over, Thomas Francis stood up at the podium at Rackham Hall in the University of Michigan and said those three famous words, safe, potent, effective, which were headlines across the United States in every newspaper. Synagogues had held special prayer meetings. Church bells rang out. It was announced over Voice of American. Department stores stopped while that announcement was made. So how do we know it was effective? We knew it was effective because 16 children died in that study from polio, all in the placebo group. We knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo group. I mean, those children were my age. I was a first and second grader in the, in the 1950s. I mean, but for the flip of a coin, they could have lived a long, fulfilling life. And I just think those sort of gentle heroes we left behind never get acknowledged in this. And, and it's... Uh, it's too bad. When I see kids coming into our hospital now whose parents are volunteering them for the trials as young as, you know, six months of age, I, I'm, you know, hats off to them. And the story is in the book, right? That story is in the book. That story is in the book. So thanks a lot, Paul, for joining us, uh, being entertaining and informative. And we will see you next on CNN, where they will not have nearly as much information from you as we have had here. That's right. What do they know? <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks a lot. All right. Take care. And thanks a lot to Jonathan and to Ada. And uh, we will see you all in two weeks. That's it for today. You've had your dose of science.